Thank you, Mary. That's a really beautiful introduction. I feel so touched, and I'm equally touched by um, Alex and Hannah's um, improvisation to Joy. And I'll um, just begin by reading from Joy um, so that you can hear any parallels between the music and the text of the poem. I should say that Joy um, is a poem spoken in the voice of Catherine Blake, the wife of William Blake, and it's um, spoken immediately after William Blake's death and Catherine is left alone, a widow in London in unfamiliar circumstances and she has to come to terms not only with the death of her partner of 50 years um, but also she has to come to terms with the end of their joint creative life. They've been absolutely um, implicated in each other's creativity for all that time. The other thing I wanted to say about the poem before I read it is that Catherine Blake's life with William Blake was very far from being easy or pleasant. Um, as an engraver, he worked in a cottage industry which was notorious for its um, difficulties, its hardships, working with really terrible poisonous substances, acids, with heavy machinery press. And so the work that she did alongside him was in no way to be thought of as some sort of bohemian um, fancy. It was really, really hardcore. So this is a, sh a small piece from Joy. The full piece takes about um, 40 minutes to read, so I'll read a short piece. The walls are wordless. There is a clock ticking. I have woken from a dream of abundant colour and joy. I see his face and he is a shepherd and a piper and a god. I see him bent by the grate setting the fire and he is a fallen demon. I see him listening to the wind and sorrowing. I see wrath and misery, fire and desolation, a thousand fires in ancient London, and then the grass comes silent, silent with the hardest colour of all, the mirth colour, the corn colour, the summer night colour. A thousand, thousand summer nights pass, and children weave their daisy chains and place them on the heads of fallen idols. He wept, he wept more tears, than there were days, and never chained the door, lest, he said, we drive an angel from it. And every morning he dipped his brush in wrath and mildness, and out of him tumbled the biggest things of all, all of them writer than the rightest calculation and truer than any compass. Yet where they were right and true, None could say, and how they were right and true, none could guess, but I knew, I knew. He was an eye, and the eye wept and frowned and smiled. The eye watched, the eye watered. The world was a moat in that eye, the moat was a world in that eye, and his brush was a blade, and his tears made a lake. How I ache, how I ache. Soul partner, and soul part of all these joys, he read to me in the summer house where we sat, when Mr. Butts came knocking and found us naked, reading as we read every warm day. The poor man liked to tell that story to everyone as proof of the wildness of our life. Though it never did seem wild to me, but consistent in all respects and full of holy sobriety, which looks to the untrained eye like wild joy. William stood then and made a deep bow to Satan, who had been watching, and said, You are welcome to our garden, sir. Satan had a round, sad face like a water wheel and seemed tired and full of pity. He wore his rainbow snake around him, and when he saw we meant him no harm, he bowed 
and shrivel to a vapour. But Mr. Butts came in and ate some grapes. <laughs> I'd like to read a new poem, uh, well, a fairly new poem, which is in, in honour of the climate change protests yesterday. This is to make up for the fact that I was driving long distance instead of <laughs> relinquishing my car and walking. And the poem is called Intimacy. Just as when you unearthed a nest and all the tiny bodies curled together touched the air and began their disintegration, clutching like children or lovers and still furred or feathered but only for that moment, already extinguished, near extinction, beginning to break apart, just as morning haze disperses when the sun tips the hilltop, so much dust held in simulation and now disbanded. I know nothing means nothing, that substances transform, Still some shapes touch more than others, nestling things, exhibiting proximity in death. To have a mouth and press it against another's wing, to spread a wing and cover over a sack of flesh, that fools me, makes me soft and hurt. The ache shaped from love for what is not, and worse, for what will be no longer. So mourning is double vapour, rising from false intimacy between one corpse and another, already gone, all of it, a loosening image of life and love, an attitude struck by the dead, their dry palms cupping air. Even so, let fools rehearse it while they have breath, the shiver when a touch catches us unaware, you carrying me to bed curled in your arms, the still warm mess of sheets, limbs, hair. I've been writing quite a lot about um, art, and as James said in his beautiful reading, not so much about a sort of like, phrases, but more of a dialogue. Quite often, art seems to be a way of unleashing something um, um, creative in, in, a, in a very different way to other work, other poetry, and other writing. And one of the people I've been particularly interested with recently is the artist Eric Gill. And I've written a, a sequence of poems about Eric Gill. Um, I'm sure you know um, Eric Gill, the famous letter writer, the letter maker, sculptor, um, artist, printer, um, who was so important and really quite foundational for 20th century art. Um, and who also is notorious because it came to light in the 80s that he serially abused his daughters. Um, and I wanted to consider how you could reconcile those various parts of an artistic life. I have this beautiful book which um, a, a friend made up for me, which I'm really proud of. It's absolutely wonderful and I'm going to read from it. It's the first, first time. This poem is called An Interview with the Keeper and it's based on an interview that I did with the curator of Gill's work at Ditchling Museum when a lot of Gill's um, archive is kept and the keeper in question was the curator um, and uh, this poem approximately describes her, her feelings about Gill um, and I was, in fact, I'd gone to meet her to ask her about Gill and I ended up talking to her about herself 
and it was a far richer experience for it. So this is an interview with the keeper. We spoke at length about the beast, how in the wild he would have been destroyed by predators, alternatively might have starved, become susceptible to small infections, open wounds in his fine hide. Truly, the maker of this beast is a genius. He burnt so bright on the fields and in the valleys. If it is possible to say of a beast, he had imagination, he had vitality. Even in his cage he is proud. There are no shortage of admirers. But, says his keeper, I can't help looking into the flaming depths. I glance in, then away. I bring him food, but I can hardly bear to look him in the face. Behold him, then shrivel, shrivel, stretch, and weep. Look, and look away. This is the pattern of my guardianship. I turn my pictures to the wall. I have no mirrors. I talk into the night about my Janus neck, supporting two heads, two sets of eyes, my conjoined sensibilities, the heavy key of the cage. Sometimes, I continued, I feel that I am the beast and I am confined. Sometimes, I finish, I feel the sea spray of spittle on my neck as I shovel and it is me spitting. And this poem is, uh, Guild did a lot of, um, as you'll know, religious imagery, um, partly because he, um, he, he became a Catholic and put much of his artist, artistic work in service of the church, the Catholic church, and also because I think he was really fascinated by making contemporary biblical images. Um, and this poem is called Translations. It's based on the various translations of a certain set of lines in the Bible. Translations. A garden enclosed is my sister, a locked rock garden and a sealed spring. My sister is a garden that is locked. My sweetheart is a closed garden, a fountain closed off to all others. A garden enclosed is my sister, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. So some of the poems in the sequence I find really hard to read out because they do deal with the experience of, of child abuse and I don't think, I don't want to read them, I don't think, I partly think no one wants to hear them either so I sort of skirt around the edges a little bit and I'm going to finish with the final poem in this sequence which has two quotes in it and it was really important to me that this final poem, because it was a series of poems that was set in some ways against the idea of the charismatic genius the single genius abusing others, um, that the poem should end in someone else's voice, that it should dissolve into quotes by other women um, writers. And so the poem finishes with a quote by uh, the Mexican poet Valeria Mea Caso, and it comes from the Blue novel, which is translated by Michel Gil Montero. Why do perpetual motion machines never work? because history only travels in one direction. And here we are considering how the purity of an image makes one think of a great civilization where frightening technical skill for a rare moment is the free instrument of the highest sensitivity. So embraces, contortions, lascivious women, Members erect and flaccid emerge like Pompeii's walls from the rubble of a disaster and are cleansed by water. For English is a language of water and good for recording disaster. I'll finish with two newer poems. One of them was a commission by um, 
There was an exhibition recent, recently, I don't know if you saw it, about the Romanovs um, at the Queen's Gallery in London. And I was commissioned to write a poem for that exhibition. And I was really um, struck by the collection and how much had been lost and dispersed, as was inevitably the case with collections of art in Russia um, over the 20th century. And so this poem is a response to that, really, to the loss of art and uh, creative effort. And it's called Dark Matter. The contents of the museum were moved to a bunker and then disappeared. Old photos show us what was lost. A few black and white old masters taken at a distance. A grainy picture of a statue hunched, ready for flight. The parure of a lost queen on a throat of ancient velvet. Even the urge to speculate on their fate is muted now, shipped out, wrapped in sack, burnt, or heaped over with the gravel and rock of a dying city. The odd leads trail into darkness, which is where the other nine-tenths of human endeavor end. The known world expands but the world we buried grows faster still. Its statuary fills a universe of mirrored halls. Its songs echo soundlessly. And tangled in the stars, a thousand poets whose faces lie smashed under battlefields. As we seek to perfect the chord, the line, the divine form, remember wax tablets scrolls, scribbles on palace walls, trampled into strata. Remember how porcelain melted. Remember there's an undone precedent for everything we've done. Somewhere, dark energy is shooting coins from forgotten civilizations into a jukebox larger than the sun. I'll, I'll end with a poem um, which is also in its own way a response to a piece of art. In this case, it's Rachel Kneebone's ceramics. Um, she has a wonderful sort of fall of the rebel angels ceramics with lots of body parts all um, conjoined, linked up, which is fantastically beautiful and precise because it's porcelain, but at the same time full of gristle and muscle and bone, and it's a wonderful bringing of the two together. This poem was a commission for um, a book about walking, and it's, um, I couldn't write about walking. I like to walk a lot, and I do a lot of long distance walking, but I couldn't find a way to write about it. And then I saw this statue, and I thought, I think I've seen the way in to walking. So it's called The Fall of the Rebel Angels. But before I read it, I'd like to thank poets and players um, for all your hospitality here today, and thank you for coming along. And, um, and James and Catherine for their, for their readings. Um, it's been such a brilliant day, thank you so much. This is the fall of the rebel angels. They didn't fall. It wasn't a pillar of legs and arms, a downpour of limbs, a shaft of flesh like a rainstorm over the sea. No, they walked. They shouldered packs, laced boots, adjusted straps. In high-tech technical wear, Fleeces, gaiters, fearless, the angels dropped from mountain top and picked through the debris of rock, hopped over pavements, sundew, scrikes, down scarps and slopes, entering the world on the thinnest paths, the GRs from the stars, the trails, the aura of a rope team on a glacier, the scramble, the clumsy jump, the odd angel on a bog, jumping like a man from clump to clump of cotton grass, falling into mud on a seraphic arse, over stiles and gates, shifting slate and dry stone walls, built before the world knew how to fall, and bathing in tarns, marvelling at lambs, napping under pines, walking, walking in angelic lines. And when they slept, their up till then unused legs kept walking in their sleep. Their dreams were of rights of way. 
And even when the coming of day meant binding feet and the dampness of wings, still they hoisted their packs and took their flasks and walked and walked, lacing the land with endless small tracks, which led where angels did not fear to tread, down into valleys and snaking over passes, shining tracks, visible to the naked eye, the man in glasses, the woman holding a map. Daily trespassing angels, angels who walked, who fell from grace into mountain streams. Forgive us our lack of dreams. We have forgotten how to rebel. Thank you.